Okay, great. Well, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Erica Sickles and I'm a registered mental health counselor intern. And I run the school counseling program here at Lutheran Counseling Services. And as part of this program, we try to do different outreach opportunities to share about ways to boost different parts of mental health. Um, this whole year, especially with COVID, this whole school year, I should say, we're focusing on resilience. And so each month we take a different piece um, of the puzzle, I guess, of resilience and try to work on boosting that. So for this month, we are um, focusing on optimism. And so in today's session, we'll talk about what optimism is, how we can spot it, a little bit of how to look for it in ourselves or any kids in our family or any kids we may work with, um, how to increase it, and really some of the benefits of why we would want to increase optimism. And then also noting when. There actually are some times that optimism might not be the best way to go. Um, and that was some of the questions that I got um, in preparation for this. Um, as you guys registered, that was one question of kind of balancing that reality, optimism, um, pessimism, and, and how to not be um, somebody who is maybe too optimistic if that is a thing. And we'll talk about how that could be. Um, there could be too much optimism in certain situations. All right, let's see how to forward. Okay, here we go. So here's a list of what we'll go over today, um, what optimism is. We'll talk a little bit about the definition and a lot of what we're going to talk about, um, we're going to get into a little bit of the history of Martin Seligman, um, who really is the founder of this. But um, if you can see me in the presenter view. This book, Learned Optimism, um, is where we're going to get a lot of our information. And we'll talk a little bit about the history of how optimism came to be such a focus of study and, and really why. One of the key terms we're going to get into is this idea of explanatory style, essentially how we explain the things that happen in our life. And as we look and really dive into what we do in our heads to explain things, that's going to tell us how optimistic we are, how pessimistic we are. Um, and so we're going to dive into that. We're going to talk about what optimism isn't. Um, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about just thinking positively and um, there is there's actually some very specific things as we go back to explanatory style that really make up an optimistic perspective. And then we're going to talk about the benefits. Why do we want to look at optimism? What are the benefits? What can it do for us and the kids that are either are in our family or that we may work with? Um, we're going to talk about this ABC model. Um, that's a pretty quick way to check your explanatory style, um, but then also to change a pessimistic style or kind of boost some more optimism. So that's the framework of where we're going to go. And to get started, it'll be a little bit of a history lesson. And so this goes back again to Dr. Martin Seligman. So he's known as the founder of positive psychology. So a little history on the field of psychology, um, going back into even the 1900s and earlier, the focus was really on what's wrong with us. Um, depression, anxiety, those types of things, lots of different disorders, trying to diagnose, but it really didn't look at how to increase positive qualities in our life. It was very much about decreasing negatives, which is great, um, but as Dr. Seligman talks about, just decreasing depression doesn't increase things like happiness, optimism, fulfillment, a sense of meaning. And so really starting with his research shifted the entire field of psychology to start to look at some of those positives and how to boost them. So the early research, the reason we have this little puppy here on the screen, the early research in um, the field of psychology that Dr. Seligman was doing was actually using dogs, putting them in what they called a shuttle box. Not the most ethical of research. Um, they were administering them some shocks. And then over time, they learned that they were able to get to the other side of the shuttle box for portions of the experiment. And then for other portions of the experiment, they were prevented from moving away from those shocks. 
Later on, they came back, removed the barriers, and the dogs could get to the other side of the shuttle box when they experienced those shocks. But a portion of the dogs learned that they were helpless. That's true even when they weren't helpless. Now, for the researchers, they got in the shuttle box. They tried to show the dogs, you can get to the other side. It actually totally ruins their research. But in a different way, they learned, wow, these dogs have learned to become helpless. We've conditioned them with just, in some cases, just a few instances of learning to be helpless. And they've learned, I'm helpless. I cannot change the circumstances of my environment. And so it led them to think, well, if we can learn to be helpless, can we learn to be hopeful? Can we learn to be optimistic? Can we unlearn helplessness and instead learn optimism? And so they found that actually you could in the same way. Um, at the time, psychology was also very much into behaviorism. And the main ideas behind behaviorism are if you control the environment of an animal, of a child, of an adult, then you can control their actions and their behaviors. Um, so again, kind of earlier in the field of, of psychology, mid-1900s, they were learning, well, there's actually more to it than that. And they started to look at, well, how did these dogs learn to become helpless and how could we teach them to be hopeful again and to exert some control on their environment? And so here's a quote from Dr. Seligman, habits of pessimism lead to depression, wither achievement, and undermine physical health. So they learned, again, as studying all of these kind of negative pieces of in the psychology world, they learned that that's what happens with pessimism. But he says the good news is that pessimism can be unlearned and that with its removal, depression, underachievement, and poor health can be alleviated. So they really learned that there's a huge connection between optimism and pessimism in all of these areas. How much we achieve, what our health status is, um, what our depression or our mood status is, is all linked very, very closely to this idea of optimism or pessimism. And so again, this book, uh, Learned Optimism, is a key piece of most of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I do recommend it. They've updated it since it first came out. Um, but this idea of how to change your mind and your life and, and that doing those things and shifting your optimism really does make a huge difference. So most of what we're going to talk about today does come this, from this book by Dr. Seligman. And so we can look at optimism and we can define it in a number of ways. This is from the American Psychological Association talking about hopefulness. Um, so optimism is that idea of hopefulness, the attitude that good things will happen and that people's wishes or aims will intimately be fulfilled. And so we think about this um, when we are able to be mindful and touch base with what's going on, really have that self-awareness, it helps us to get a sense of how hopeful we are. Um, a different way to think about optimism is to think about expecting the best possible outcome. And that's where a little bit of that reality comes in and being realistic about what's possible. Um, but having that sense of expecting the best possible outcome or having that sense of hopefulness is key to optimism. And so here's where we get into really that key piece of explanatory style. So this is the idea of how we explain events that happen to us. And so each of us can even think about anything, even today we might've had something happen and how we explain it to ourselves can give us some clues about our explanatory style. And so we're gonna look at this a little bit more, but over time, our explanatory style really shifts how we understand the world to be um, the world around us. And so as we talked about it, psychology has gone through a couple different movements and the impact of our cognitions, this whole cognitive psychology movement um, over the last couple of decades has really shown that what our thoughts are really impact our life experiences. They impact how we see things, Continually, when we talk to um, people who've maybe witnessed uh, uh, some, something maybe like a car accident, 
how they explain what happens has so much to do with their own internal way of understanding the world um, that it actually can alter what we even see going on in the world around us. So that's definitely true in our own lives. How we explain what's happening can let us know is there, a, is there any hope, really that idea of hope, hope, hopefulness? Is there any hope in things going differently? If I do something differently, is there hope that things can change or be different in some way? And so we're gonna look very detailed at specific portions of our explanatory style that help us know if we are more on the optimistic side or pessimistic side. And it has to do with whether a good event happens or a bad event. So an optimistic explanatory style is gonna look at good events that happen and they're gonna think about those good events as more permanent, meaning they're gonna last for a long time or even forever, more personal. This good event happened because of something that I did and more pervasive. This good event happened in this one area of life. So that means good things can happen in other areas of my life. So looking over at this, essentially an optimistic person is magnifying the impact of good things that happen. And so as you kind of tune in or check in maybe with what you might be doing or what kids in your life might do, if a good event happens and they think about it, yeah, I'm good, I'm able to do this, I was able to make this good thing happen, that means other good things can happen to me. You kind of think about this as overall, seeing how this can connect to our mood, our sense of hopefulness, our sense of happiness, authenticity, joy, a lot of other things that actually Dr. Seligman has researched. Um, essentially those good events, the way we explain them magnifies their power. So that optimist is going to go into a bad event and minimize the impact of that bad event. So they're going to see that bad event as more related to external circumstances. It's temporary. Yes, it's bad. It's in this one area, but it's not going to last forever. And it's very specific. Yeah, this one area, it's not all areas of my life. So that optimist routinely explains things in a way that make good events magnified and their impact is magnified and make bad events minimized. So they have less of a negative impact. So keep this in your mind as we move forward because pessimists reverse it and you'll see what I mean. A pessimist is going to explain good events by minimizing their impact. So this good event happened, yes, but it's external. It has nothing to do with me. Maybe it was luck. Um, it's temporary. Just because this good event happens, I'm still waiting for the shoe to drop. You might hear some things like that in your own mind or others. Um, it's just temporary. This good event, sure, sure. It's very specific. Sure, this one good thing happened in this one area of life, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna happen again. There's no reason to expect it to happen again. So as we tune in, we notice maybe there's some of these kinds of things going through our head. On the same kind of thinking of this pessimistic thinking, the pessimist is going to make a bad event bigger in just the way they explain it. It all goes into how we explain these events. So a bad event is going to feel and they're going to explain it as permanent. Yes, this bad thing happened. Yep, this is forever for a very long time. It's going to feel very personal. Well, it's because of me. I'm flawed in some way that this bad event has happened and it's going to feel pervasive. It's not just in this one limited area of my life. It's gonna bleed over into all areas. You kind of think about it as like a black cloud that kind of stretches out over other areas of life. And so you can see how these two different approaches, an optimistic style makes good things bigger and small thing, or bad things smaller. The pessimist is going to limit the positive impact of a good thing and it's gonna magnify the negative impact of a bad thing. Now, there's a lot of reasons we do this. Um, a lot of it feels protective. Well, I don't wanna get my hopes up, right? So again, we go back to hopefulness is really the core definition of optimism. I don't wanna get my hopes up. Um, let's see, a couple of chat here. Is there a difference? Let me move my chat here a little bit. Is there a difference between girls and boys with pessimism? It seems girls minimize and explain away achievements. Gosh, that's such a good point. And that can be true. So um, there is some research on that. And, and 
we all live in our cultural context. Um, so it could be that there might be um, some pressure for girls to say, oh, it's not me to maybe be a little bit more humble. Um, there are some cultures in the world too that might be less inclined to take credit for something. And so it could be, it could be related to gender. It could be related to kind of family models. It could be related to cultural models um, and a number of things. So there's going to be a lot of things that really impact how our explanatory style can build. Um, and so that's such a good thing to, to tune into, to help people. Having the awareness is huge because whatever the influences are, we can have a choice in what we're going to do with that. Um, and there is some guidance from the world around us. Um, some families, you know, might even have some kind of family sayings that either magnify this optimistic perspective or um, minimize, minimize, ma either magnify the good things that happen or minimize it. Great question. So I wanted to kind of touch base a a little bit on what optimism isn't, because I think there's a lot of ways we think about this. Um, you know, we think about we looking at the glass as half empty, and, and there's some usefulness to it, but really we've got to go back to that explanatory style um, and, and expecting the best possible outcomes is, is an example of optimism and expecting the negative, ne most negative possible outcomes would be more pessimistic. But we think about this idea of glasses and it, it kind of muddies the, it's a bit more complex as to how our explanatory style is built. Um, there also can be this idea of just, we all have to think positive and, and sure that there is some overlap with optimism. We are thinking that yes, it is possible that another good thing could happen to me because this one good thing happened to me. But just thinking positively, you know, isn't a cure all. Um, it doesn't always lead to those automatic positive outcomes. And so positive thinking on its own, if we don't understand those pieces of that explanatory style is limiting. And then there actually are times where we do not want an optimistic outlook. And so when the consequences are huge, if there is a huge negative consequence, the chance of failure um, would be devastating. That's not the time that we want to necessarily be optimistic. An example that he uses, um, Dr. Seligman uses in his book is this idea of a pilot. You know, he doesn't want to say, well, we de-iced the wings once. I think we're good to go. I'm going to expect the best possible outcome in that case where potentially um, making an incorrect choice could be fatal. That's not the time to be optimistic. Same, you know, drinking and driving. I don't think I've had that many. I'll probably get home safely again. The consequences could be fatal. That's not the time to expect the best possible outcome. It's the time to prepare the things for um, what that negative consequence could be. So it is really important and that can be a piece of really understanding how to be realistic. Yeah, we want to have the best possible outcome. But you know, as we think about preparing our children, you we want to prepare them that they're going to do really well in the school play or in the soccer match. But we don't want um, to go in there without preparation. So we're going to do the things to prepare for that. You're going to still go to practice. You're not going to just have the positive thoughts of, oh, everything's going to be great. You're going to go to practice. You're going to prepare in what needs to be prepared. You're going to memorize your lines, those types of things. Um, and it can be helpful to prepare what would happen if I forgot a line on stage. You know, we don't want to just blindly optimistically expect the best thing to happen. We want to prepare for those other things. And part of that preparation helps us to have that optimistic perspective to expect, okay, I've done the things I need to do. So I can expect that this is going to go well. And feel free to jump in with any questions as you have them or to share any examples where you've kind of seen this either in your own life or children that you work with. So there's tons and tons of reasons to boost optimism. Optimism has a benefit in all sorts of health 
areas, which makes sense as we really think about it. If I believe that my actions are going to relate to positive events happening, when a good event happens, I believe part of that has to do with things I've done then that makes sense that I'm going to believe that my actions are going to boost things. So instead of just saying, well, there's nothing I can do. It's out of my hands. I have high blood pressure. If I'm an optimist, I'm going to look at that negative event. I'm going to say, yep, that's this specific thing, but I can limit it to just high blood pressure by doing other things to take care of myself. I can go exercise. I can eat well. I can make sure I manage my stress levels. I can take any medication that my doctor's prescribed to me. I can go to the doctor, let them know. I can mobilize myself to use some resources because it will make a difference. So time and time again, in all areas of health, they found um, that optimism really, really helps. I mean, even when you have a diagnosis of something quite dire, they found um, cancer diagnosis, all sorts of things that the optimistic person fares better. And again, it makes sense to nobody would that be a good outcome. Um, so that would definitely be that bad event we talked about. But the optimistic person is gonna minimize that. They're gonna say, okay, I still have other things going on. Um, you know, Maybe there's some pieces of this that I did to cause depending on the health situation, but there's a lot of it out of my control. Those that, those that are in my control, I can take some steps to make some changes now. And so really, um, they found that those even with terminal illnesses have lived much longer if they have this optimistic perspective. Um, and I just really, I think back to those dogs, you know, if you're in that shuttle box and you learn that you're helpless, even when you're not helpless, you're going to stop trying. Um, and we found mental health correlates so strongly to our physical health. And so our physical health can really be boosted by mental health and by optimism and all of these types of things. Our success rate absolutely has to do with optimism. Um, and you think about it because if you just give up after the first time, you're not going to be as successful. Just statistically, we know that to be true. Um, and so actually he talks in the book a, a good bit about people who do uh, sales calls. And so there's that idea, you know, one more call, if I can just motivate myself to do one more call, then I can, I can boost my sales reps because honestly, the more calls we can make and the more we can engage in that, uh, the more success we're gonna have. So we see that success rate um, and achievement across the board is boosted by having an optimistic perspective. And again, as we think about why that is, it starts to make sense. So we're going to talk about some ways of boosting this. And I love this because it's something that we can teach to kids. It's definitely something we can do for ourselves. Um, the ABCs, you know, even our littlest of kids can understand the ABCs. For the littlest guys, we might have to shift this a little bit, but we can walk them through the same process. And then for ourselves, we can um, do this process. And what he recommends is to track five instances of events that have happened in our lives. So you can even think of the last day or two for you. You can write these out um, in a little journal or somewhere where you could see it. And he says to track these three things to get started for five instances. So first you're going to say the adversity. There's some kind of adversity that happened to you. This could be anything from didn't make the sales call this morning, um, dropped coffee on myself as I was going out the door to really big things that have happened either in our personal or professional life. And so he says, for that part, you're just going to write what happened and you're going to try to do that as best you can without judgment or evaluation. So for example, if I had dropped coffee on myself this morning, I'd write out the adversity that I spilled coffee on myself. I wouldn't say things like I'm clumsy or any sort of evaluative thing or judgmental thing. I'd just say coffee was dropped on me. Um, the beliefs portion is where you might come in with some of those things. What beliefs do you have about yourself or your abilities? So if I had a belief, gosh, I'm clumsy, you know, I always mess up, those types of things might come to mind. And so he asks that you write those down. Um, and, and if we do tune in, again, this is that cognitive psychology branch, we notice we tell ourselves a lot of things all day long and it really impacts us longer than just that moment. Like I said, our actual physical health is impacted by what our cognitions are. So if we can tune into some of those beliefs, that's really important. 
And then that C part is the consequences. So we had that adversity, the thing that happened. We had those beliefs, what we told ourselves or believed ourselves about ourselves often. Um, and then how did we feel? What was the consequence of those beliefs? And, and oftentimes we'll start to notice, yeah, we, we kind of feel, if I'm saying things like, gosh, I'm clumsy, I always mess up. I can't even get out of the door without having some kind of calamity this morning. That's gonna leave a lot of feelings um, that are pretty negative. And so it helps us to kind of tune in to how we might be dealing with those different things. Um, another example might be, let's say I started a class, I'm going to night school, and the adversity I experienced was a bad grade on an assessment. So I'm going to write down, without any judgment, I might say I received, you know, and let's say to me a bad grade is a C. I got a C, I was expecting an A, I received a C on this first big assignment for this class. So my beliefs could go either way. It could be, gosh, I'm really not cut out for this. I'm older than I thought. This isn't a thing that I can do. I can't compete with all of these other kids in the class. What am I even doing here? Or I might recognize, well, you know, I'm at a stage in my life where I've got a lot of other things going on. I'm juggling a lot. Um, and I, this might be some evidence that I'm not juggling as well as I wanted. And so as we think about and look at how those beliefs are, how I'm feeling is going to be very different. If I'm doing a lot of things that are really just bashing myself, tearing myself down, um, I'm, I'm not going to feel very good. And, and those are the kinds of things. If, if this is a core thing about me, so again, if this negative thing is very personal, this is a me thing that I cannot change, there's really not a lot of motivation to do anything differently. But if I'm able to look at those beliefs and I'm able to kind of go in a way where, yeah, there are some things that are extra about me as an adult going back to school. Um, I have some things I'm balancing, family at home, other job. I have some things I'm juggling. That leaves me with some room of, okay, there are some, I, I might feel a little bit more motivated to make some changes. And I might not feel as hopeless. You know, I might have some hope that things can be different. So as we start to look at how we write out each one of these things, it gives us some tools to work with. And so after we've done that A, B, C, and again, he recommends writing down five instances for each of that A, B, and C. And he says, there's a couple of choices to do here. And so we're kind of going along A, B, C, now we're at D. He said, sometimes we just need to distract ourselves. So interrupt, interrupt our thought pattern and just stop. And he'll say things like, um, literally like put your hand up and say, stop. Sometimes we might've done this with your children. If you've ever um, worked around children and they're just kind of in a tantrum, sometimes they just need someone to say, stop just pretty clearly. Okay. And then they can kind of take a breath and kind of move forward. And we're the same. Sometimes we just need to stop and focus on something else. Um, early on in the field of psychology, I, I have a little hair tie here, could be a rubber band or something. They would just kind of have a little snap, just stop something. Um, when I work with kids, I do tend to work mostly with kids as a counselor, I'll have them kind of flick it away. Um, so just stop, whatever that thought is, just stop focusing on it. We'll take up little pieces of paper. You know, if they want, they can write down whatever that thought is, that belief about themselves. And, and kind of flick it away. And that's fun. They like kind of flicking stuff all over. So it's something you could do with your kids at home too. Um, or sometimes it feels like it is important to do it, but right now it's not productive. You know, I'm having these kind of negative thought patterns. Um, um, my beliefs about myself just right now is not a time. The reason our brain brings that to attention is because it wants us to know it's kind of like danger, danger. This is something we need to know. Hopefully we can change it and then move forward. Um, but if it's not something that's imperative for us to do right now, then it's helpful to write it down and set a time later to think about it. So that's distraction. Sometimes that's all we can do is just kind of distract. That's a great tool for young kids. Now, if we are able to um, kind of dispute it, that is longer lasting. The benefits are longer lasting in it and it tends to work over time. And the disputation is where we start to change our explanatory style. Um, so first, it could be finding evidence to counter that pessimistic belief. 
So if I feel like I'm just constantly a mess, I always drop things, I'm just um, a klutz, I'm not successful, then I could find evidence. Yeah, it feels like that this morning with coffee all over me, but actually most of the time I'm pretty successful. I'm able to do the things I need to do. So finding that evidence to counter that pessimistic belief is important. Then finding alternative explanations for your actions. So yeah, for the test example, maybe I didn't fail that test because I'm just not cut out for it. Maybe I just am managing a family at home. I have a lot of things and I just, I didn't devote as much time. I didn't understand how much study time I would need for this. So there, the reasons that I got that C and that, or that grade I didn't want might have some other explanations other than I'm just flawed and I can't do this or I'm not able to be successful here. And then exploring the implications of those pessimistic beliefs. Again, sometimes we go into it, most of the times we go into it thinking, well, we're just going to protect ourselves. We're going to think pessimistically. We never get our hopes up, then we can never get our hopes let down. But actually, it doesn't tend to work that way. Having low hopes all the time doesn't tend to be better. And again, the field of positive psychology said, how can we boost positive things, not just minimize negative things? So sure, we want to minimize disappointment, but living with low hopes and, and minimizing disappointment by always expecting the worst really just isn't in our best interest. So exploring those implications of pessimistic beliefs is really important. What is... Um, what am I doing to myself by thinking about these things? And that can give us the motivation to start to change some of those beliefs. Um, and then, yeah, again, examining the usefulness of these beliefs. Usually there's a reason we try to protect ourselves. And if we can say, you know what, it doesn't actually make me feel any better or make me any more successful to prepare to always be disappointed. So those things can help. And so when we're able to dispute those negative pessimistic explanatory styles over time that's where we start to change and we start to um we kind of think about this as a continuum from very pessimistic to very optimistic and we can start to make some movement over time by tuning into what we're thinking in our head those beliefs that we have and so adding on we have those abcs that we did then that disputation is great and then noticing the energy in our body, um, in our mind, in our really our motivation to do things differently. And if we're able to dispute those negative beliefs, we shift over to that positive explanatory style where there is hope. We do believe I could do something that would make a difference, um, that could make things go a little bit better. We start to see things we could do um, and options that we have. And over time, that really, really makes a difference. So these could be the types of things that we do for ourselves. Again, kind of writing down those last five things. When kids come to us and they experience some kind of adversity, we do that, hey, how was your day, honey, um, conversation. And then they say, oh, this happened. We can try to help them if they're old enough. Um, I'd say elementary school and up can start to think about, you know, explain what happened. What beliefs did they have about themselves? You know, how does that make them feel? And then we can ask them some of those questions and kind of dispute that. Wow, you know, whatever the issue is for them, it could be a grade too. Well, you know, wow, that's really rough that you got a bad grade on your spelling test today, but. I, I know you said it feels like you always do poorly, but I looked at your report card or I looked at your grades online and, and most of the time I'm seeing you do really well. This seems it was very specific, just that one test. And we can help them to see again, a lot of times those things are very specific. Um, and, and so instead of blowing it up in the moment, we're very emotional. A lot of reasons about how our brain um, is, is put together that make us very emotional in those moments. But if we can stop and be kind of rational, we, we start to use, when we do that disputation, we start to use um, a more left brain, logical, linear thinking side of our brain. And it kind of calms the emotion a little bit. Um, and so kind of asking kids those questions can be really helpful to help them dispute the always or I never or I, you know, can't ever do these things um, and to notice it in ourselves. And I just always on any um, of our talks that we do, I bring up Brene Brown. I love her. But I also think that this is so important. The single most important thing that she's learned from her research is that we cannot give our children what we don't have. And I would say with optimism, maybe more than most other things, 
this is so true because how we as parents, as teachers, as educators, um, as how we explain the things that happen, the kids around us are going to pick up on and that's going to become their own internal explanation. And so I think that's so important for us to really kind of tune into that and do our own work um, in order to help them to have an explanatory style that sees more possibilities, sees more hopefulness, again, magnifies the good things that happen and really minimizes those bad things that happen because the bad things are always gonna happen. Um, and so finding a way to say, okay, well, this is just temporary. This is just this one specific thing. Sometimes we can learn something from it um, and we can grow. So yes, this happened, it feels very personal, um, but we can use that to move forward for ourselves as well as our kids. So any questions? I know um, that question about kind of being reality-based is really important. Um, not just being totally positive without kind of tuning into reality. Um, and I guess I, for that piece, I would just remind us too, our reality is so much based on our belief system and so much based on what we tell ourselves that as we tune in again for that evidence, we're looking for evidence, we're not making this stuff up, but we are looking for evidence and tuning into that evidence is reality based to say, well, actually, you know, there is evidence that I'm not a mess up, that I'm not always a klutz. Um, and those things can help us be grounded. And sometimes there is evidence, wow, I just, you know, I didn't study enough for the spelling test. There is evidence for that. But again, kind of tuning into that gives us that hope and that next step on what we can do, um, study more next time and, and recognize that and not take it as personally, kind of depersonalize some of those um, negative things. Yeah, explaining our reality can be controlled. Yeah, absolutely. Preparation is huge, you know, and even thinking that idea that preparing is important is an optimistic explanatory style because we do believe that, you know, positive things that happen are due to us. And so things that we do to prepare are going to lead to those positive things to happen. So that is a huge piece of it for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And really, you know, the research shows that over time we are able to, to make those disputations. Sometimes we just need to distract ourselves, but when we're able to make those disputations and dispute those negative, I call them, I call them ants actually for the kids I work with automatic negative thoughts that just pop up over time as we dispute them and we have evidence that goes against them, it really helps to, to change our whole outlook. And that changes not only our physical health, our mental health. Um, Dr. Seligman goes on to talk about a sense of meaning and purpose and really just authentic happiness. That's one of his other books. Um, and optimism is a key, key part of that. So I'll share um, a couple of resources here, and I can email this out as well, the, the slides um, as well. But the first few chapters of this book, Learn Optimism, I recommend, and it's available on YouTube and you can kind of listen to all of his things. Um, I think hearing it from him, it, it's him and another speaker going through the exact examples here. Um, they do have a, an assessment in the book that will let you know what your explanatory style is. If that's worth it to you, you know, you can find this book on Kindle, you can pick it up um, in most bookstores. Honestly, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's kind of an oldie, but a goodie I'll say. Um, and then you could take that assessment yourself if that was helpful to you, but really just tuning in to those ABCs that you do will let you know where your explanatory style tends to be. Um, and then listening to that book is really, is really helpful as well. So I hope this has been helpful, giving you a place to start, a couple of things you can do with yourself and your kids to really boost that level of optimism and, and really see results across all areas of success, achievement, mental health, and even physical health. So thank you for coming. If there's any other um, uh, topics that are of interest, I'm happy to do webinars on any other topic to really boost resilience, optimism, any, any mental health, positive mental health aspects. We're always happy to do that. So just let us know and thank you for coming. Thanks, take care, reach out if we can be of help in any way and boost that optimism. <laughs>